<laughs> well, uh, hello everyone, and, and thank you, Ruth, for the introduction. And, and I think I'm going to take a moment and add a little warning to Ruth's introduction. This comes from my 10th grade English teacher. Uh, my 10th grade English teacher took me aside one day, asked me up to her desk, and said, John, I have good news and bad news for you. And I said, lay it on me. She said, well, the good news is you write beautifully. She said, the bad news is, she says, you never stay on topic. <laughs> so the reason I bring that up is that I know our topic today is the uh, observational drawing, and I want to promise you that is part of the content I have for you today, but there's going to be a bit of a ramble, uh, because I also want to talk about some topics that circle around uh, this great topic. So that said, uh, let's go forward, and I'll tell you what I have to say. Uh, I was so privileged as a young man to study uh, art in the Bay Area. And there's a lot to say about that, but to put it in very, very simple terms, in the Bay Area, in the post-war period, there was a wonderful kind of a situation where modernist abstraction and modern representational painting coexisted and sparred and eventually kind of worked it out and hybridized. That's how we got the style called the Bay Area figurative uh, style. And my mentor, my most inspirational instructor, uh, was Nathan Oliveira. And uh, boy, when I fell into his classroom, it was like waking up. Uh, there was so much uh, good information. I, I, I tell people I almost stalked him. You know, I was at his office hour. I wanted to hear everything he said. I went to his studio. I, I had so much to learn from, from Nate, from who he was, and, uh, and from his art, from everything about him. And uh, some of the things he said mystified me a little bit at first. And this is one of them. I heard a couple of different versions of it. He would say it in painting. He would say it in drawing, which I, I took from him. He would say, there's an energy that comes from my mind, through my arm, into the, and you fill in the blank, the charcoal, the paintbrush, printmaking, whoops, his thumb, you know, directly. But there's an energy that came through my arm, you know, from, from my mind. And when I first started hearing that, I thought it was a little bit supernatural. You know, I thought it was like a little bit kooky, but, but you know, I was, uh, I was fascinated. And later in life, you know, with a little more maturity and, and you know, making art myself, uh, and, and by the way, that's one of Nate's drawings, where you can see that energetic, you know, attack on uh, a drawing the figure, you know, the energy coming through kind of literally in the energy, the physical energy of the drawing. Um, later in life, I came across this fantastic self-portrait from 1933 by Katakolvitz, uh, and I should tell you, by the way, Nathan studied with Max Beckmann at Mills College after the war. So there's a German connection. But anyways, I saw this incredible drawing by, by uh, Kolbitz, and I thought, that's what Nate was talking about. That's it in a drawing. And I know you're, you're tempted, a couple of you, I see some people walking out the back at the left door, that's okay. But, you know, you're saying, John, that's modeling, that's the mass of the arm of, of the artist, and, and she used the charcoal to present mass. I look at that and say, that's kind of a coil of energy. And that is the connection that Nathan was talking about. It's what it means to be an artist, to be that alert and turned on. And all, even some of the buzzwords we use today, right, engaged mindful, the things we, we try to be and that we wish our students would be uh, more often. It's all there in that, that drawing, the kinesthetic side of drawing. Because one of the things I want to say to you today, and, and I'm probably preaching the converted, but I want to say that drawing is a form of dance and that art is the record of that dance, of that performance. There's a tremendous kinesthetic learning that goes into drawing. So my Thesis, which I will, you know, wander from, forget about, negate, contradict, and all those things as, as I talk to you. But my, my main idea is that drawing connects the eye, the mind, and the body. And I think that's absolutely profound. I probably could end right there and feel pretty good about what I had to say to you today. But I have more time. <laughs> One of the things, now this is where I wander a little bit, I, I thought quite a bit about observation, and I have some things to say about uh, observation, but I've been getting more and more interested in perception and the pairing of perception and observation. How, what do they have in common? What do they not have in common? And I went to that very august online source, Wikipedia, by the way, for this uh, text, which I cut and pasted. <laughs> ironically, but, but here it is. Perception is when you, you organize, you identify, and you interpret 
sensory information. And in the case of drawing, that's mainly visual, although not, not all, but, but sensory information. And then what you do with it is you represent. And not only do you represent, but you also understand. And I'm going to add a third thing that, that wasn't in Wikipedia. Feeling is involved in this. And I love the quote from Cezanne, art without feeling is not art. And I think I just botched the quote, but that's the essence of what, uh, of what Cezanne said. So like uh, the speakers before me, and I really related to, to so much of what Sharon had to say and, and, and the work that she presented, and also to Vincent's comment that you have to you know, fall in love with what you're drawing. Uh, I just think that learning to draw a live model is an incomparable experience. And it's an incomparable experience for all kinds of reasons, including the fact that I think even those of us with innate talent and students with innate talent start out just so bad at it. <laughs> it's so difficult because we all at some level love and value and identify with, and, and I mean this biologically and psychologically, but we all have such a strong bond with the human figure that it's terrifying and wonderful to draw the human figure. But the presence of a live model, there for your observation, it's a form of intimacy, and it's something we all feel. We all feel and respect the human presence. I think that's part of why it's such a great tradition. And by the way, just throwing something out there, I'm not a big fan of the idea of progress in art history. Uh, I just kind of have the idea that there were artists in Egypt, and there were artists now, and we all have the same basic problems as, as artists. <laughs> So let's talk about observation and, and perception. And I'm going to make some grand generalizations that I think you could easily knock down, but uh, why not? I have the podium. Uh, <laughs> in my side-by-side, -side, I found an atelier cast drawing. And there is a resurgence now of ateliers. By the way, I'm going to put a plug out there. The Bo Bartlett Center just opened in Columbus, Georgia, at Columbus University. And Bo hopes to have the first atelier connected to an accredited university in the United States. Now that I said it, he's got to do it. But he's got the building. And the model, by the way, Vince, is PAFA, museum, school, you know, bonded together. Anyways, but, uh, you know, a cast drawing uh, is great for teaching observation. The cast never moves unless you have an earthquake. It's not, it's not human, right? Uh, but if you want to learn light and you have good electric lighting and you have hours and hours and hours, cast drawing is, is a valid way of developing observational skill and patience, which we all need uh, more of. On the other hand, I think the situation of, of modern and postmodern artists, which is an anxious situation, I know we live in tremendous anxiety, uh, Protestant anxiety mostly, but uh, if you look at this Giacometti drawing, that's a great example of a modern drawing where there's so much perception along with the rendering. You can see that uh, Giacometti had a female figure in an interior, and you can also see his struggle to comprehend not just the form of the figure, but also to find its relationship to the environment. And that's something, if you're interested in that issue, you want to read some of what Vincent has to say about what he calls technical narrativity. And in short, and I better get this right because he's here, <laughs> Uh, in short, you know, that's just the idea that, that part of the narrative of a work of art is everything the artist goes through to make it, that we see in a work of art. And in a drawing, it's so intimate, right? You know, so intimate, the, the, this technical uh, narrative. But anyways, what, what Giacometti was, was dealing with, the figure in an interior and in space and how he felt about the figure, which was a very neurotic situation. I mean, wasn't it, didn't I hear once that, that uh, Giacometti used to sometimes walk close to the wall in Paris because he was afraid he'd fall into space? A very sensitive uh, man. But, uh, you know, that, that kind of anxiety and that sense of, of life and, uh, you know, mortality, all those things, uh, that's a part of the modern tradition, right? And something that was very much emphasized when I learned to draw was, was gesture drawing. Ten seconds, one minute, three minutes maybe for, for a long one. And I, you know, what I got from Nathan Oliveira on this was, it's about drawing the aliveness of the figure. Right, you can't be accurate, you can't really deal with anatomy, you can't deal with you know, the na Latin names of, of muscles, but you can express the idea that the figure's alive through movement. And uh, what a beautiful kind of byproduct of observational drawing to, to draw gesture, to draw aliveness. 
I also had a chance to study with Elmer Bischoff at uh, Berkeley. And Elmer uh, was a little bit taciturn, but he was, he was one of the you know, original Bay Area figurative artists. And I'll tell you a story about him. One day I brought him a figure drawing I was really proud of. I had really worked it, you know, 45 minutes, which was a long time for me. And I thought it was a good drawing, and I took it over, and he was very unimpressed. <laughs> like, like in a really kind way, though. I was a really kind person. Oh, John, I'm, I'm really underwhelmed. Thank you, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I, I asked for criticism on this drawing, and he said, to, he said to me, he said, John, he said, there's no environment. He said, where is this figure? He said, it's not going to be a drawing for me until you tell me something about the model through letting me know where the model is. And when you look at an Elmer Dr Bischoff drawing or painting, it has some of the same concerns as Giacometti, right? It's like, wh what's happening and where do they belong and where are they in, in environment and, and in space? And that's perceptual, right? Part of, you know, including the environment is a perceptual concern. So yes, I worry, and this is kind of an easy dig, isn't it? But you know, I do worry, are, is technology disconnecting us from some of the subtleties of perception, some of the subtleties of drawing? And I want to say something nice before I go into the full slam. But, but I, I had some people on Facebook tell me, you know, I'm using a Wacom tablet or I'm using an Apple Pencil. What do you think of digital drawing tools? They seem pretty neat to me. And I have ZenBrush on my uh, iPad, which is fantastic, you know, for Asian style uh, calligraphy and, and, and images. But I guess, you know, as soon as you have a screen involved, there's software supporting the screen, and it's like driverless cars. I want to drive my car. I'm sorry. I want to be the one who decides when to swerve. And I want to hold my pencil in a physical way. When, when there's too much software doing the work, some of what Nathan talked about is going to go away, I think. But uh, anyways, I do worry that, that things for our current generation, and, and yes, this is a geezer moment, but I worry that things are going to be too easy, right, in, 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 in drawing and so many other things. Vincent, you know, talked about a little bit of this. What, what's missing if you're not observing? And again, photographs are valid material, screens are, are valid material. I know some painters that have beautiful big screen LCDs in their studio that they work from. But I think we want to have art that is based in a foundational aspect of observation. I think you want to do that for, what, 10 years or 10,000 hours to steal an idea. You, know, you, you want to really, really do that. And then you've matured in your observation and your perception, and you can use any source material that, that you uh, want. But I, I look here at the young man. He's drawing on a Wacom tablet, and his subject matter is on a screen. And I sure had a lot of students in the last few years in painting class you know, from an iPhone, they're trying to do a still life, you know, or a baboon, photorealism, or, or something. And I just think, oh, that's, that's going to be second best. You know, take me to, uh, to observation. So in terms of, you know, the happy side of my presentation, I want to talk about what Ann Harris is doing. Ann's an instructor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And by the way, we're on Facebook Live. Ann, if you're listening, hello. I stole, I copied all your stuff, you know, without <laughs> telling you. But uh, I want to say something about what she's doing, and this may give you some of ideas about a, about a program you can do at an institution near you. She has a, a roving program called the Mind's Eye that is based in self-portraiture. And it's very, very simple. To do this, you need drawing supplies and a mirror. That's all, all the technology. And she has been going to various uh, colleges and community organizations and institutions, and she has a, really a, a dual program. She absolutely has the students do self-portraits, which what, that's the oatmeal of drawing classes, right? We've all done that and very bland stuff. We've all done self-portraits. But she adds the element of perception. And she insists that you are both observing, but from your observation, you're engaging uh, other faculties, and you are also touching on the imagination and developing that. And this was recently, just a few months ago, she was in LA at the Dalton uh, Garage, working with students there. It's really a, a very social situation where all of this development, all of the drawing uh, happens with a group of people and, and they all go up on the wall together. So the, what the mind's eye really does, and, and again, emphasize this, begins an observation but emphasizes and encourages perception as part of the process. And here's a couple of students that are putting up uh, finished drawings in uh, Memphis where Anne was there in uh, 2015. And there's a row of some of the drawings that came out of the mind's eye. 
and I'll just let you stare for a minute, you know, without maybe commenting specifically. But, but uh, what this brought up for me, it brought up that wonderful quote from Margaret Mead. Uh, didn't she once say, you are a unique individual, just like everybody else? <laughs> it has that quality of uh, we're together as a social uh, unit. Everybody's drawing together. Everybody's sharing this experience. But that element of individuality and self-expression is there. Some students draw fairly well in what you and I would call a skilled fashion. Others are complete beginners. But there is a kind of participation and interest, at least in the project, that is universal. And so again, this is, a, this is, I know, a little bit too easy, shooting fish in a barrel, right? But uh, there's a big difference between a selfie and a self-portrait. Um, I know we all are concerned about, we talk about narcissism now, how narcissistic is our culture, how do we encourage and develop you know, narcissism? I mean, this is a scary thought. And initially, making a self-portrait, well, that could be a pretty narcissistic exercise. And yet, I, I look at the way that uh, you know, Anne is doing it in the mind's eye, all of the things that, that Sharon and Vincent talked about, all of the attention, the interest, the skill, uh, the frustration, all of those things that go with observational drawing are part of it. And they open up this process. Whereas the selfie, it's a reflection that's mechanical, and it's very, very self-conscious, right? because you know it's going to go on social media. They're thinking about it in such a different way. And the perceived self that you see in, in the mind's eye, that you see in these uh, drawings, gets out there in relation to other perceived selves, and they have a kind of a conversation. And it's a pretty quirky conversation that is a little more internal and not so self-involved and more expressive than what you'd see with a mechanical self-image. And I just did this, I went to, I, I used hashtag selfie on Instagram and you know got that screenshot and then I put up images from the mind's eye. The differences are pretty fascinating because uh, participants in the mind's eye are, uh, they put themselves in situations, they caricature themselves, uh, you know, with all kind, you know, a little bit of bite there in, in the caricature. Uh, they are a little more emotional in uh, what they do. And of course, it's a little bit less, here's who I'm with, or here's the food item I'm enjoying. You know, it's a little bit less uh, materialistic. So the thing that I want to say about drawing, this is my chance to kind of come back and, and you know, prove my English teacher wrong, you know, prove that I can stay on topic. But observational drawing, and in particular, I'm going to stay with that theme of life drawing. It lets us know who we are, and it also lets us know who others are. And I'm assuming that many or most of you have been in a life drawing class, and you know that feeling, it's the feeling when the robe comes off, right? And uh, hopefully, you know, it happened at a time in life when you had the maturity to be respectful, or if you didn't, the teacher talked to you, or you developed it quickly, and there's a naked person in the room. And from that naked person, you learn what the nude is. You learn that the nude is the Western idealized form of beauty which you should respect, which is something to look up to. And I don't think it's a coincidence from the, that the, from the Renaissance forward that a healthy relationship with the nude is a hallmark of a healthy society uh, and a democratic society at that. So there's just something so profound about the practice of drawing done right. There is something so respectful and connective. And I think that's the thing. I think it's that kind of social value, maybe even more than the artistic value, that makes me say, take a look at your program, take a look at your institution, and ask yourself, uh, how can you use this kind of drawing and this kind of situation to give people a more meaningful, uh, intimate, deep relationship with the material that they are drawing? Bring them into drawing, and as Vincent said, they will fall in love. And by the way, it can be platonic. It can be a little bit erotic. It can be creepy. It can be whatever it is. Uh, but uh, let people fall in love with uh, drawing, and you'll see, I think, a deeper, less self-involved person because what beauty does is it takes us out of ourselves and makes us less self-involved. Thank you so much. <laughs>